diagnostic tests that examine the uterus and fallopian tubes. This is to ensure we're offering the best personalized care. So today on Lunchtime Live with the Center, we're talking about the pelvic exams we recommend to our patients. One of our lead physicians, Dr. Daniel Groh, is back to discuss the hystrosalpingogram, or the HSG, and the sonohistogram as well. Hi, Dr. Groh, welcome back. Hi, Ami, it's nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get started with the HSG. What is it and why, why do we do it? Yeah, so, so HSG stands for hystero, which stands for uterus, salpingo, and we refer to the tubes as the salpinges or salpingo gram. So it's a, you know, gives us an image of the uterus and the fallopian tubes. And it's a pretty standard test. It's been around for decades, you know, as a, as a primary test for fertility. And it gives us an awful lot of information. It tells us about the inside of the uterus and whether or not there are any abnormalities on the inside of the uterus, like fibroids, endometrial polyps, or adhesions. Or sometimes patients have unusual uterine anatomy, and it helps us discover that too. It also tells us if the fallopian tubes are open. Okay. The way we do that test is we put a little catheter. It's a, it's a catheter that looks like a blue spaghetti noodle. It's soft and flexible. And just the tip of that catheter goes in to the cervix. So we, we put a speculum in like we would for a pap smear and clean the cervix, catheter into the cervix, and there's a little teeny tiny balloon at the very tip of that blue spaghetti noodle that holds, we, we inject some water. And that water goes into the uterine cavity and then comes out the fallopian tubes. And we take a couple of x-ray pictures. There's very minimal radiation exposure, but it'll give us a, a pretty detailed picture of that water inside of the uterus. The water has a marker in it that shows up on x-ray. So we get a, a picture of the inside of the uterus and we can tell if the fallopian tubes are open. And does everybody need to about, do this? I'm sorry? No, I was going to go ahead. I was just about to ask if everybody needs to do this. Yeah, so, so we do it on many patients. If the patient has any history of endometriosis, any prior pelvic surgery, or, you know, or any reason to think of any inflammation in the pelvis, uh, a ruptured appendix or appendicitis, we want to make sure the fallopian tubes are open and, and that the egg and sperm can get together. So it'll tell us if the tubes are blocked at the, you know, near the uterus or at their distal end near the fimbriated ends. Um, it just gives us a lot of information about the uterus and the tubes. And, it, and is there any particular point during a woman's cycle when this is done? Does it have to be a certain day? Yeah, great question. So we usually do it after a menses is finished, but before ovulation happens. So usually we target cycle day six through 12. So after the menses and before ovulation, and that's a, a window of time of about a week when, when it's pretty safe to do. And now, why is that? Um, well, we, we don't want to make, we don't want patients, if patients are bleeding when we do the exam, it can, it can interfere with the exam. And we want to make sure there's no chance of pregnancy when we do this exam. Got it. Um, is there anything in particular about this? Does the patient need to have a full bladder during this procedure? No. In fact, we, you know, we, we may prefer an empty bladder. Okay. Um, so it's more comfortable. And I, I personally have done thousands of these exams. And, you know, the most common question I get from patients is, 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 is it going to hurt? Yeah. And, and if you read, you can read internet reviews on hysterosalpingograms or blogs saying that this was a painful test. And, and sometimes patients are, you know, almost quivering with fear for this test. Hmm. And almost every time that happens, the patient at the end of the exam says, oh my gosh, that was nothing. 
that didn't hurt at all. I'm so mad at myself for being worried about this test because <laughs> it was almost painless. Oh, that's good to know. Do we, do we offer any suggestions if they do get nervous? Do we, do we offer medication for this? Or yeah, it's a great question. So, so one thing to remember is that all of the physicians at CARS have done this test many, many times. In fact, most of us have done it thousands of times. And so we're very, very good at it. And our goal is to, is to minimize your discomfort. So okay. that's the first thing to remember. Um, second is that we, you know, it doesn't hurt to take an ibuprofen just to, just to premedicate and help with any, you know, help dull the pain if it should occur. We also ask you to take an antibiotic called doxycycline mm. the day before, day of, and day after that test just to prevent any infection. Oh, good to know. Okay. And does a, does a patient need a support person there, say, to drive them um, or drive them there to and from? Yeah, not typically okay. because there's no anesthesia. And, and like I said, it's usually very well tolerated. Um, sometimes um, patients like to bring their husband or partner or support person and and if they do I often meet with them all together to explain the results at the okay end. so you get a result right away after oh the we'll tell you the result you know as soon as we know it and we'll show you the pictures on the screen okay and review that with you this is done in the office done in the office okay now we're the we're one of the only groups that does this in the office mm -hmm. you know if this is done by your OBGYN doctor. It's usually done in the radiology suite of a hospital. And that creates a little bit more stress for everyone because you're not on a comfortable exam table, you're in radiology, and you know, and they just don't do these as often as we do. Got it. Okay. Well, moving on to the sauna histogram, what exactly is that? So it's a similar test. And and the goal is to see if the uterus is normal. Okay. And again, to detect fibroids, polyps, adhesions, or other uterine anomalies. It's done a little bit differently because it uses ultrasound instead of x-ray. Okay, But except for that, it's pretty similar. Um, we put the catheter in the same way. We use that same blue spaghetti noodle mm -hmm. catheter and we just place it into your cervix and inject a little bit of, in this case, of just simply sterile saline. And, and the water um, on, on ultrasound is black. So it, it serves as contrast. So, so we place this little catheter, inject a little bit of water into the uterus, and then do a transvaginal ultrasound to look at your uterus and your ovaries. And because the water is black, fibroids are whitish or grayish on ultrasound and polyps are whitish or grayish or intrauterine adhesions or you can very clearly see them mm. when we put some water into the uterus you said sometimes that... we can see... oh, go ahead please um sometimes we can see a uterine septum or we can see if there's a double uterus or some other uterine abnormality so it gives us a very detailed view and if we're looking for fibroids the HSG can tell us if they're there. Okay. But this sonohistogram, we can see the fibroids. We can measure them very precisely for size. We can see whether or not the fibroid is close to the uterine lining, which is a problem, or if the fibroid is on the outside of the uterus, which really isn't a problem for fertility. Okay. So for fibroids, polyps, and adhesions, it's often a tool we use before we go to the operating room so we know what to do. Um, and it gives us, yeah, it gives us a lot of information. Does this sonohistogram have to be done at a particular point in the cycle as well? Again, it's done between day six and 12. Okay. For the same reasons, to avoid menses and to avoid pregnancy. And you're saying for the HSG, it may show a fibroid or a polyp, but for the sonohistogram, it gives you more information, more details about it, it. It does. You know, on x-ray, we'll just see a 
like a shadow or a, an indentation as to where the fibroid is. Mm -hmm. On ultrasound, we'll be able to see that indentation is being caused by a fibroid per se. Okay. And we can get precise measurements and we'll often classify that fibroid with a staging system called a FIGO staging system. Okay. Um, you can't do that with simple HSG alone. You really need to combine it with ultrasound. Now, we do other types of ultrasound. So this is a saline ultrasound. What's the difference between the other ultrasounds we offer versus this, aside from the saline? Does it offer a different view, different, uh, how, what do you see differently? Yeah. So, you know, um, we often do ultrasounds for um, patients for their new patient visit, mm -hmm. or we do ultrasounds when monitoring ovarian follicles. If we're doing in vitro fertilization, a, a patient will have a couple of ultrasounds during their ovarian stimulation to watch those follicles on the ovaries grow. Got it. And so, so those are pretty routine. We, you know, we will capture that information during a sonohistogram. We'll look at the ovaries and count the little follicles on the ovaries, note whether there's any problems with the ovary. Um, um, and the, the regular ultrasounds, we, we do routinely to look at the uterus and the ovaries. Okay. All right. So um, Nikita says, I just had mine done yesterday. A little bit of pain, but it was okay. And the nurse practitioners are very gentle with me. Um, who does the actual tests? Do the nurse practitioners do them as well? As the doctors? Yeah. Um, good question. So the HSGs are almost always done by physicians, not because the nurse practitioners can't do it, but because for some licensing reasons, they're not allowed to use the release the radiation from the x-ray machine. Okay. At least that's my understanding. So, so typically physicians will do the HSGs, but the, you know, we have a, a number of people who can use the can do the sonohistogram. So nurse practitioners um, have been trained to do it very well, actually. And is there like, a, is there a time period, say someone came and then there's this gap between when they first had the sonohistogram done versus when they're ready to cycle? Do they need to redo the sonohistogram at any point? So, you know, you know, many of the procedures we do, you could consider high stakes procedures. We want you know, if we're going to transfer an embryo to the uterus, we want to make sure it implants. And we want to make sure there's nothing preventing it from implanting. Mm. And, and so it's become our practice to repeat some evaluation of the uterus at least yearly to make sure that polyps or fibroids haven't grown. Got it. Or if, if unfortunately, if someone has a miscarriage, occasionally there's some of the pregnancy tissue that remains in the uterus um, and doesn't totally come out. And, and that, again, would prevent pregnancy. Oops, I think I lost you. No, I, I lost. <laughs> I lost you, too, but at the, oh, there we are. Gotcha. I'm back. Well, I was going to say I had lost you, but at the same time, this was that, that those were the final questions I had anyway. <laughs> so I was going to I was going to thank you for being here. Um, it's always nice talking to you. Oh, it's my pleasure, and Ami, it's always fun to talk to you. And thank you for thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, we'll be back. Uh, next time for another Lunchtime Live, and be sure to check us out on our website at yukonfertility.com for additional information as well as a calendar events to support you and to help you feel connected. See you next time. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.